Hi everyone, I'm here with a true story. This one is called Marvelous Message. It has a quote before it from The Deserted Village by Oliver Goldsmith. And still they gazed and still the wonder grew. The one small head shall carry all he knew. Marvelous Message. Julie Rose O'Donnell started life with an unexpected strike against her, cystic fibrosis, a genetic life-threatening disease that causes progressive lung deterioration. But even as a toddler, she never let it trouble her, says her mother, Mary Ellen. Julie was reasonably healthy during her early childhood, experiencing an occasional infection, but always bouncing right back. As she grew, she learned to sew, snorkel, water ski, perform with an Irish dance troupe, and play on her school's basketball team. Her courage and spirit won her a special place in the hearts of everyone in her Riverside, Illinois community, especially her five older brothers and sisters. One of Julie's favorite activities was taking care of her little nephew, Nicholas O'Donnell, the son of her brother, Ralph, and his wife, Jan. Julie connected to Nicky the moment he was born and really took an interest in him, Jan says. Little Nicky was crazy about Julie too. The pair frequently went to Brooksfield Zoo, not far from their homes and were especially fascinated with the dolphin display. They spent hours watching these angels of the sea and knew many by name. One day, Julie, Mary Ellen, Nikki, and I were at the display, Jan recalls. My mom had just returned from a trip where she had been swimming with the dolphins and we talked about how exciting that would be. That's what I'm going to do someday snorkeler Julie declared to everyone, eyes shining. I'm going to swim with the dolphins. If anyone would have the spunk to do it, Julie would. But the idea seemed more unlikely as she turned 12. At puberty, cystic fibrosis becomes more critical. By winter 1993, the disease was progressing and routine treatments were no longer effective. Julie's physician at Lola University Hospital in Marywood decided that a double lung transplant was Julie's best hope. Julie and I were beepers during that spring and summer, waiting to be notified that lungs were available, says Mary Ellen. The night the call came, I asked Julie how she felt about it. Mom, Julie said, I wish I could say no but it means I'll get a new chance at life, so I have to say yes. She did. In fact, the transplant was such a success that Julie came home in only six days. Her extended family, as well as friends and neighbors who had kept so many prayer vigils, were ecstatic. Living with transplanted lungs is not trouble-free and can be very difficult, Mary Ellen explains but Julie experienced many, sorry, many wonderful days of healthy breathing. Two-year-old Nicholas, who had been especially worried, was thrilled when she could play with him again. Now for sure I'm going to swim with a dolphin someday, Nikki, Julie, would, Julie told him one day at Brooksfield Zoo, and why not? Always an optimist, Julie believed her future was unlimited early one October morning, however. Julie awakened, looking pale. Mom, she whispered, I don't feel very good. Julie's physician discovered that she had a viral infection in her blood. He hospitalized her immediately. Three days later, when the sepsis triggered acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS, he put her on a respirator. Worried family and friends gathered. The doctors considered doing another lung transplant, Mary Ellen says. 
They put out a call across the country, but no matching donor was available. On the morning of October 23rd, 1993, Jan and Ralph got ready to go to the hospital while Jane's father and her brother Tony stopped by to take little Nikki to Brooksville Zoo. We knew Julie was very sick, Jan says, but she had come through so much, we were all praying that she could bounce back again. Jan gave her little boy an extra hug as she sent him off, grateful beyond words for his robust good health. Nicky had a wonderful morning visiting the animals, and his grandfather and uncle were relieved to see him running and jumping, hopefully unaware of everybody's worry about Julie. Suddenly, however, Nicky paused in his play. Standing completely still, he frowned as if concentrating deeply. Then he looked up at Grandy. Julie's in heaven, he said. Jan's father was startled. He hadn't mentioned Julie all morning. What did you say, Nikki? He glanced at his watch, exactly 12.08 p.m. Nikki's little face was set and serious. He would say no more. Concerned, his grandfather brought him home so his mother could calm his fears. But when Jan opened the front door, her tearful face confirmed Nikki's words. You don't have to tell me, Jan, her father said gently. Nikki already did. No one knew what time Julie's life had slipped away. Although there were people at her bedside, no one had thought to look at the clock. But a few days later, Julie's parents received a hospital certificate with the time of death plainly marked. It was 12.07 p.m. How did Nikki know? No one could understand it. Even stranger, the knowledge did not all diminish his grief. For several nights, he sobbed in his crib. Julie, I need you, come back. No one could console him. And during the next several weeks, he continued to mourn. He was so little, not even three years old. His relatives told one another, surely he would forget soon but it didn't seem to be happening. Several weeks after Julie's death, Lola scheduled a memorial service for the families whose children had died at the hospital. During the previous year, many of the O'Donnells decided to go, including Jan and Ralph. I was hesitant about bringing Nikki, especially since I knew people would be weeping and this might upset him, Jan says. But although Nikki never falls asleep right after dinner that evening, he did. Ralph carried his sleeping son to the car, strapped him into his seat, then took him out and carried him to Lola's chapel. Oddly, Nikki slept through it all. Jan was glad, for the service was indeed painful. I guess I'm kind of a sign person, she says. I'm always hoping something will let me know that things will be all right. Julie, we miss you. How they all needed some comfort, just a little reassurance that this raw grief would someday lessen, that Julie was home, safe in God's arms. Julie, send us a sign. After the service, Jan and Ralph put their still slumbering toddler back into the car and headed home. A few minutes later, Nikki finally awoke. You had a long sleep, Jan turned from the front seat to look at him. What were you dreaming about? Nikki smiled. Julie. It was the first time he had mentioned her in days. What about Julie, honey? Jan asked softly, dreading his tears. But Nikki was still beaming as if he knew a wonderful secret. Clearly precisely as if he were aware, delivering a message in words, not his own. He looked directly at his mother, Julie, said to tell you, he's, listen, Julie said to tell you, he said, that she's swimming with the dolphins. Dolphins? Could it be true? Jan remembered Julie's long ago pledge and tears filled her eyes. 
home safe with angels of the sea and of heaven. It was what Jan had asked, what all of them needed so much to know. Nicky was still beaming, and now his father Ralph had a question. Nicky, he said, is Julie happy? Eyes shining, Nicky threw out his arms. I can't reach as big as she's happy. Today, the pain of loss is still hard. And faith sometimes falters. But the O'Donnells take heart in the message. Nicky brought them, especially since he never again mourned Julie's loss. It's as if he was given a glimpse into eternity. And why not? The things that seem to grow people so perplexly are usually quite simple to children. The noted Christian mystic. They have not quite forgotten God from whom they came. Nor will anyone forget Julie Rose O'Donnell, who is in her all too brief life. Graced the paths of many. She loved well and deeply on earth and still does so from heaven. A little child has told us so. I hope you guys have a good night.